It's now time for a flashback. My greatest Super Bowl experience happened my first year as a columnist in Dallas, Texas. This was January of 1979. I was 26. Super Bowl 13, Cowboys versus Steelers in Miami. I had already covered three Super Bowls, but not as a columnist, so I couldn't pick and choose what I wanted to write about. Very different. I didn't have near the freedom that I was about to have at that Super Bowl. And that started with the Cowboys Steelers first game, which was Super Bowl 10 in Miami. I went on to attend 33 in a row, 33 Super Bowls in a row. I weirdly missed the one in Tampa, which was Pittsburgh against Arizona, the Roethlisberger late touchdown pass to San Antonio. And I'm not sure why we missed that, but I was at ESPN and for some reason we just decided not to go. But I hark back to that week, January of 79, just something about Miami in those days. Those Super Bowls truly lived up to their Roman numeral status. And I'm talking Roman. I'm talking like Caligula Roman, Bacchanalian Roman. I believe the media hotel, if memory serves, was the Americana. And was this not Americana at its greatest? Lobby would be filled every afternoon, every evening with celebrities and celebrity wannabes and high rollers and low rollers and bejeweled sun goddesses. It was a floor show. And I was in my element. In those days, they had the commissioner's party on Friday night be held at the Civic Center where they would just take over the entire, it was like a giant airplane hangar of five-star food for miles and miles. Everything your heart could ever desire, you could eat your heart out at the commissioner's party, which featured celebrities and media and owners. You could just walk for hours and people watch. And I was just on fire writing that week because it was the greatest collection of talent ever assembled on a Super Bowl field to me. You have 10 Steeler, soon to be Hall of Famers. Our man Terry Bradshaw here at Fox, all he did was win four of these, four Super Bowls. Mean Joe Green and Franco Harris and Jack Lambert and Jack Ham, Lynn, the great Lynn Swan and John Stallworth and Mel Blunt, right there with Dion as the greatest corner ever. He, he reinvented how to play that position physically and physicality. Mike Webster, their center, and then the Cowboys, my Cowboys, Roger Staubach, my all-time favorite Cowboy, and Tony Dorsett, and Drew Pearson, who finally got in the Hall of Fame because he should have been in a long time ago, and Randy White, the Manster, and Rayfield Wright, the left tackle, and Cliff Harris, and Jackie Smith, loaded with talent everywhere. And I got swept up in the week and I got a little crazy, and I got a little carried away, and I had just split with my junior high sweetheart, my first wife, and I'll admit publicly, I even had a little fling that week with a woman that I met in the lobby, an older woman, and I told my wife, Ernestine, I'm gonna mention this on the podcast, and she said, go ahead, so long ago, don't worry about it, so she knows. It was just what everybody did, this is the 70s, and when you went to the Super Bowl, that's just what you did. So I fell right into the trap. And I must admit, I loved it. And when I got back from that week, the executive editor of the Dallas Morning News, for which I worked, named Tom Simmons, told me it was the greatest stretch of column writing he had ever seen from anybody, and he, he had been around for a long time. And I was so honored by that, but I knew I just got swept in a, along by the, the vibe in Miami, on Miami Beach and Val Harbor. And then came the game at the old Orange Bowl that just oozed with, with clutch history. And what a game it was. It turned on two plays. It turned on poor Jackie Smith, a great tight end, one of the great pass-catching tight ends ever. 
a little pop pass, just a little one of these kind of passes from Roger Staubach, wide open. And as he fell back, he just hit him right in the hands and he bobbled it and he couldn't hold it and he dropped it. I'm sure he still lives with and is haunted by that memory. And then, of course, there was a call on Cowboy cornerback Benny Barnes that just lives in infamy. He was called for tripping Lynn Swan, and he did not trip him. The only one who was tripping on the play was Fred Swearingen, the referee who threw the flag. I, I have no idea. To this day, they got robbed again, and I, I still wonder if the league has some kind of plot against my Dallas Cowboys. I, I don't know, but it sure seemed like it at the moment. Pittsburgh prevailed 35 to 31. Terry Bradshaw was the MVP. These aren't big numbers by today's standards, but trust me, in those days, they were huge because it was Terry's career passing day. 17 to 30 for 318 yards. Charlie Waters, the great safety who had played corner for the Cowboys, pulled me aside in the postgame locker room and told me that he was furious with Tom Landry, the great Tom Landry, a Mount Rushmore coach for leaving them in the flex defense on first down, which meant man-to-man -man coverage. He said Pittsburgh knew every first down that we were in straight man on Lynn Swan and Stallworth, and they couldn't cover them. And Terry Bradshaw ate on first down and ate them alive on first downs. And I went with that story and it was a mind blower. It was a bombshell of a story co-signed by Cliff Harris, the other safety, Hall of Famer. And what a week that was. What a time in my life that was. And I look back on that week as the single most special week of my career. I hope you enjoyed that video. You ready for more? Make sure you click that subscribe button for all the exclusive content from The Skip Bayless Show. And don't forget to check out the full episode of the show wherever you get your podcasts by clicking the link in the description.